My name is Carter Cleveland, and I'm the founder of Artsy. Artsy is an online platform for learning about and collecting art. Um, this is the first time in history that so much of the world's art has all been aggregated into one place online where anyone can view it um, from anywhere in the world for free as long as they have an internet connection. Um, part of the experience is about seeing the art and understanding the art and learning about it, and that's why we created the Art Genome Project which maps all the essential characteristics of art, much in the same way that Pandora um, has the Music Genome Project, which does the same for music. So, for instance, if someone discovers a work by Mark Rothko, they will actually see the related genes um, for that work, such as abstract expressionism, or New York School, or color field painting. And they'll be able to click on those genes and learn more about them, and then discover other um, related artists. I actually never intended to be an entrepreneur uh, growing up. I was, I was very into art growing up. My dad's an art writer, so I got dragged around to a lot of galleries, a lot of museums, um, and my dad just always talked to me about art from a very young age. Um, I also, uh, I always loved sports, um, and I always loved uh, math and science, and um, one of the reasons why I chose to come to Princeton actually was because it had the best physics department in the world. Uh, so I originally came to Princeton and was enrolled as a physics major, um, and I actually remember flipping through uh, the course catalog and coming across a description for, I believe it's COAST 401, which is artificial intelligence, which at the time at least was taught by Rob Shapiro, and just reading the description and thinking, wow, that's the coolest thing I've, I've ever read about. But I realized it was an advanced course, so I had to take several other courses to be allowed to take it. So I actually just started taking, um, I think, two, 229 and 217, um, uh, applications and um, uh, I forget what 217, 217 was the one that I found much harder it talked about like pointers and me memory management in C, it's still very fun now. Um, so I originally just took those courses so that I'd be able to take artificial intelligence. Um, but in the course of taking those courses I realized, wow, this is programming is really, really fun and you still get a lot of the same challenges of the math and the physics, but you also get to create things. You get to like generate these amazing applications and these programs that can solve problems. Um, I, I also remember writing programs that would just create really beautiful visualizations. Um, so I ended up switching actually out of physics into computer science and engineering. Um, and the first time when I ever considered the possibility of entrepreneurship, uh, up until that point I figured I was going to be a like a theoretical physicist or, or something, um, was actually when I took Ed Shao's, um, uh entrepreneurship course um, my junior year. And I just thought it was so fascinating how you could build something uh, out of nothing. And I actually remember one day after class uh, talking to Ed and saying, yeah, you know, like sometimes I have like all these crazy ideas to start companies. And I remember him telling me, he probably doesn't remember this himself, but I remember him saying, Oh, I think you totally could do it. I think you've got all the all the pieces to do it. And I was like, wow, like really? Like could that actually be possible? I was like, he probably just says that to, to everyone. Um, but that was the first time when the idea got in my head of like, oh, I could actually start something. Because in 09 it, it was pretty um, I know it's very like now it's like a very popular thing, but in 09 there, you know, the vast majority of people it was about getting into like finance or like consulting or something like that. So that was really what planted the seed in my head. And then um, Artsy really started um, Actually, I don't ever talk about this because this is this is like really kind of insider. But it, the first idea for Artsy came about when I was taking Coast 333 um, with Brian Kernahan, and for the final project, you have to um, come up with a project that you're going to build with other students in the class. And one of the ideas I threw around I was like, guys, what about a social network for artists? <laughs> and I think we said. Well, that's a really great idea, but there's no way we're actually going to build a social network for artists like, you know, um, within the scope of this one project. I think today, with all the tools that are out there, you could probably spin up a social network for artists in like a few days of work. But, but in 09, or no, this was even 08, um, that was like a really like challenging thing to do. So we ended up doing something much simpler. But then I kept like thinking about that idea, and I remember actually meeting uh, with people who are getting involved in tech and entrepreneurship, and being like, yeah, you know, like, I've got a few ideas. I've got this one idea, like, it's never going to make money, like, it's never going to be a profitable company, but I just can't stop thinking about it, which is this idea of, like, a social network for artists, or, like, a way for artists to get their art online and more efficiently connect with an audience. It's just, I have no idea how it would ever make money, but um, 
yeah, I just I just can't stop thinking about it. And I, I, that's how I was originally like kind of talking about it with people. And then it was really the fall of my senior year. And this is the part where like in the press I talk more about Artsy's beginning, but that's a little bit more. It's it's real genesis. It was actually Coast 333, uh, my junior year, um, in Ed Shao's class, uh, uh, my junior year. Um, but it was it was really kind of senior fall where I started just doing more and more research, and I just started realizing like there is no there is no website with all the world's art on it. Like that's such a simple idea. There should clearly be a site with all the world's art. And that was when it really started to hit me. Like, man, I should go and build that site. And like another big part of it was, um, I was very inspired by sites like Netflix and Pandora. And I remember it was actually my senior year when uh, the Netflix prize was going on, where they offered a million dollar prize to the team that could beat Netflix's current um, algorithm. Um, the current quality of the algorithm by 10%. And uh, I remember it was like the most amazing intense competition where it literally got down to like a buzzer beater finish of like two teams competing to like break the 10%. And so I was just very like excited about companies like Netflix, companies like um, Pandora, and, and not just the fact that they were bringing all this content online to a mass audience, but also creating these really like interesting algorithms about how to recommend it for people. So kind of on a, just on a very sort of like kind of nerdy academic level, I was really interested in that idea of like, you know, the same reason why, like when I saw the description for artificial intelligence in the course catalog, same like idea really drew me to this, uh, to this notion of creating a website for all the world's art, because I knew part of that would be in creating a recommendation system. And like creating a recommendation system for art is such an interesting challenge, because it, it means you have to understand like, why do humans care about art? Like what makes art similar to some works of art and not some other works of art. Why do some people like some things and not others? It's like this really kind of interesting question that kind of you know gets at these almost like philosophical questions. So I just found that all very interesting and, and, and fascinating. And, and that was a lot of like kind of how Artsy got started. I just started working on it my my senior year. Like it's really funny talking to um, friends of mine now. Like uh, like I was in Dziak, which is one of the student dance companies at Princeton. And you know, hopefully anyone watching this video from Princeton like knows, knows Dziak, you know, Afro. Um, but uh, like, whenever I talk to my friends from Dziak, they always um, say, "Yeah, I remember senior year, like in between um, rehearsals, or like you know, when 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 it wasn't your turn to go up and do choreo, you'd be like right back on the sides, like with your laptop, working on artsy, um, like in the you know during even like during rehearsals and, and performances. Um, so yeah, really, that was really kind of like how it." how it started, just interspersed with everything else I was doing from classes to also, um, also on the squash team and, and, and DZ. I absolutely did start it in my dorm room. The cliches are, are actually very true uh, in this case. I mean, it's funny, like, one of my one of my roommates from senior year just got, uh, he, he got back from Afghanistan, where he was in the Marines for four years, and he came into uh, into my office, like, right here, you know, which is now, like, you know, pretty pretty big, like six thousand, almost six thousand square foot office. It's an entire floor, and I remember him just like coming in from the elevator, and he's just like, he's like, oh my god, he's like, last time I saw you working on this thing, you were like on our couch in Henry, and now we're like in this giant space. And so uh, yeah, that was pretty funny because he literally had just like gone overseas for four years in the Marines, and so he literally went from seeing it like on the couch to like having this entire floor with like 360 views of New York. So that was pretty funny. Well, the initial money came from um, the previous summer I had uh, interned at a hedge fund as a software engineer. So they paid really well, which was awesome. <laughs> um, and it was a really fun job. And you know, I love, I love programming, so it's, it's great. Um, but yeah, the savings from that was definitely what funded RC initially. Um, it's really funny. Funny thing about like going off of your savings is what you do is you say, well, okay, I'll I'll spend up to like two thousand dollars, which when you're a senior in high school uh, in college is like an extraordinary amount of money. Like I'm not going to spend more than two k. Like once my bank account gets to here, that's it. And then I remember it like got to there, and then I was like, okay, well, you know, like I think I could probably go down to like maybe here. But that's that's actually it. Like otherwise, it's just irresponsible. <laughs> it's like every time I'd set myself a new limit, and then just eventually I'm like, I am out of money. I have no. I cannot go to dinner with my girlfriend anymore. Like I remember, I remember that. Like going to dinner and like like her birthday dinner and my card getting like re declined. Um, yeah, it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad when your when your girlfriend has to pay for her birthday dinner.
like bo both of your portions. The second money I got was from Princeton. Thank you very much, the Princeton Entrepreneurship Club. I did the, the Tiger Launch competition, and um, I, there was a, I forget exactly, but I, I got second place at the Tiger Launch competition, and I got the Audience Choice Award. And I think the Audience Choice Award was like a thousand bucks, and then the second place was maybe four thousand dollars. So I actually got like, or no, I feel like total I got more than that. Maybe I got around, I feel like I got like six or seven, or maybe even like eight, eight K. So it was like significant money, something like that. Um, and then I also got free office space in Palo Alto, which is awesome. So that was my first funding. So then when I graduated, flew out to Palo Alto um, with that money and free office space, and you know started just started kind of designing and, and coding. Um, and then I would say first like actual funding that we got after that, after that money started to run out, was friends and family. You know, like I think the first guy who who, who cut me a 25k check, like awesome guy was someone whose daughters I coached in tennis growing up. So I was like his daughter's tennis coach. And he, you know, he was just like, yeah, you always seemed like a nice guy, like a smart guy. You know, I think he kind of figured he was like paying for my for my business school education. And he was like, I'm just marking this as zero and, you know, whatever. And, and I think that's absolutely the right way to think about it at that stage. Um, but, um, yeah, so far it ended up working out for him pretty well. So far, so good. Um, and, you know, other sort of like family friends like that who just knew me growing up. And I think in the early days of fundraising, you don't have anything to show often, and especially if you're like coming out of school. Um, although I feel like these days a lot of kids coming out of school like have already built amazing web apps and stuff. But yeah, for a lot of people starting out for the first time, you're really, you're really banking on your personal social capital you've built up with your friends and your family. Um, and then eventually, as we had more more to show, we had a prototype to show. We had products. Um, we we were able to attract more angel investors, um, just people that you you know you meet through the community. And that's just like a lot of hustling. That's like I think when I I ran out of money in Silicon Valley, so I moved back to New York. And it was like in New York every single night, just every tech event. I was going to every single <laughs> event every night and just meeting everyone and. You know, so I could find people to hire, uh, people to to invest, and um, that was kind of how we we started to get angel investors. Just having like hundreds of coffees and lunches and meetings, and you know, asking people to invest. And you know, you'll get like a hundred no's, and then you get maybe a maybe every now and then. And one day you get. You know, I remember the first time you get a yes, you're almost like you're like, oh well, well, why wouldn't you? Wait, oh, oh, great, yeah, <laughs> um, that'd be awesome. Um, so you know, here's the terms. You have to almost. I remember like the first time it happened, like I wasn't even expecting it because I've been rejected so many times. I like forgot to. I like just started. Uh, I, yeah, I almost like, like kind of caught myself. Um, and you know, and eventually you start to get some yeses, and then then this crazy herd mentality kicks in, and suddenly everyone wants to invest, and suddenly you know you're the you're 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 the, the the attractive person at the party, right? You go from being the person who isn't even like let in, and then all of a sudden these like herd dynamics kick in, and then suddenly everyone wants you. Um, and so that was kind of how we you know ended up going from being totally self-funded to, towards getting that initial uh, seed stage funding. You know what you need in the early days is always going to be different because it, it matches the growth and the evolution and the needs of the company. I mean, that's kind of like the beautiful thing about companies is they're just like they're almost like these beautiful um, like creatures that sort of start out like really small and like you can't even really see them. You have to sort of squint and like you you have to kind of like almost hallucinate them <laughs> initially, and then like you start to be able to make them out, and then they become a little bit more real, and then each time they grow. They need different things to go in different directions. So for me in the early days, what I had, what I brought to the table was was almost nothing really. It was just like I was very passionate that there should be a website with all the world's art. Um, I just believed in that really strongly, and um, that's largely what I had. Um, I also was very excited about technology and artificial intelligence and you know I had more of this theoretical physics background so I was very comfortable about the algorithms like I understood like how all the recommendation stuff would work um, what I did not bring which I think a lot of computer science majors bring is act is actual web engineering is actual engineering experience so I actually didn't you know I, I could build things but just very slowly so I really needed someone who actually would bring the web engineering experience and so and also the product experience like design and stuff like that. So in the early days, it was like people who could help with that. Um, 
and you know, we <laughs> made a lot of mistakes, like learned a lot of things, um, you know, but eventually found the right technology partners to, to actually take Artsy from this sort of like, you know, ethereal like creature and actually start to turn to something real, something that we could demo and show to people. Um, another big breakthrough is that we uh, met um, our president and COO, who was a former executive at Christie's who built out their private sales to like 100 million in revenue in the first 12 months, and before that was a Bell Lab software engineer and like a math major from Columbia, so like kind of like the perfect like code meets art world executive. Um, guy and so he joined and brought that experience and operational ability and art world relationships and art world expertise. So that was like a critical piece of Artsy becoming real. Was someone who had that amazing like domain expertise and just you know maybe even more importantly just someone who's fundamentally a really good person that I really like trust on deep level. Um, and we also uh, shortly afterwards met our uh, head of engineering DB who runs all our technology and um, Robert our head of design. Who runs design and and um, and is responsible for our, uh, our product? I would say in the in the early days, um, in the early days, it was it was really about getting a product out there, and then it was really about building relationships with galleries and museums. And so a lot of people we were hiring was about product and technology, and then about galleries, and museums. And I'd say like today, now that we're kind of just growing and scaling, um, we're hiring a lot more. People that are that are very junior, like maybe right out of right out of college, um, who uh, are doing uh, gallery uh, relationship management. Um, I think we just hired actually a few people from Princeton on the gallery relations team. Actually, from Princeton, um, we're also hiring people to work on the genome team. So this means for all the art and artists coming into our system, we have a team of people that will act like art historians that will go through and categorize all the art and the artists based on art historical information. Um, so we're hiring a lot of those people. We're also hiring a lot of writers now. So we're creating a lot of educational content. We're writing about the shows and the auctions and the fairs and, and just the art. Um, so we're hiring a lot of writers as well on the editorial team. Like those are the teams that are probably growing the fastest. But of course, we continue to hire uh, engineers, uh, designers, um, product, product people, um, marketers. We're, we're growing the marketing team very quickly as well. Um, yeah, I would say that's like largely how we've how we've changed. Oh man, I could talk all day about the culture of RC. That's probably, but if I was gonna die tomorrow, that's like what I'd want my tombstone. Just the people on the team. Um, so the culture. So if I had to describe our culture, what I'm really describing is the kinds of people that we want to hire and the kind of behavior. That we that we reward at Artsy. Um, so so the most core thing about Artsy in general is this very abstract idea, which is the idea that our purpose is to bring together art and science. So two worlds that often um, kind of don't trust each other or don't interact with each other much. And you know most people who are like really into science maybe aren't that interested in art or they're kind of like distrustful, those artsy fartsy people who are kind of off in the clouds and you know don't really know what they're talking about. Or you might find people who are like really, really into art, but they're very distrustful of those like highly logical, rational people like, oh they, they you know everything has to be about numbers, like everything has to be about logic. Like they don't understand the power of intuition, like they're missing the bigger picture. You know, you, you know, you, you'll often hear that. But I think that for like, you know, a good percentage of people, like maybe twenty percent of people, um, I think really believe that like the real kind of beauty is in bringing art and science together. Like there's, there's, it's hard to articulate because the act of articulation is inherently a kind of logical process of like mapping concepts to symbols. Um, but th there's just something magical there about bringing together art and science, and um, you know we just believe in doing that. And I would say that's the most kind of on a very abstract level, that's the most core part of like what art is about and what our culture is about. And you know you see that manifest itself like. Um, in all sorts of different ways. You know, for instance, our decision-making process. Um, you know, some companies are like totally gut-driven. You know, I shoot from the hip. Some are very much about like, everything has to have a number behind it. And instead, Artsy, we, we do both. So we say, what are all the numbers? Like, what are all the metrics? Let's analyze these numbers as much as possible. Let's like constrain the state space of possible solutions to a problem. But we found that for all like the hardest decisions, the most important decisions, there's always like a gap. Like, you can only constrain. You can use logic to kind of and numbers to kind of like guide the decision, but almost always you're still left with a gap. And it's within that gap where the human in intuition, that sort of like human multidimensional artificial intelligence like is so powerful and you have to make that judgment call. You have to go with your gut. So we very much believe in bringing those two things together. And you know, I'd say Facebook and Apple are also very similar in how they do um, 
uh, decision making. But it also means when we look for people, look for people who are like very smart and very rational, but also like have really great intuition um, or like really great collaborators. And that brings me kind of my next point. It's like the people we hire, we look for people who are like ultra high performers, like people who are the best in the world at what they do, but who are also incredibly good collaborators, people that other people just love working with, that they enjoy. You know, anyone we hire has to be someone that you are excited to wake up in the morning to get to go to work with. Like, I just can't wait to go to work and get to work with this person. They're just so awesome. Um, and that can be tough to find, too. There's a lot of people who are great collaborators but don't actually um, perform. There's a lot of ultra-high performers who are, like, awful to work with. And we've had to make the painful decision of saying no to great people many times because they don't satisfy those two constraints. That's a critical thing. Ultra-high performance but amazing, humble, like, zero-ego collaborators. Um, and I'd say that's, like, the second most important thing. Uh, about our culture. And then I'd say, you know, just to kind of like round it off, I'd say we all at Artsy, we also all believe in this notion of of, of like education. Um, like if you look at Artsy as a website, what are we doing? We're making all the world's art accessible to anyone with internet connection. It's a very like educational mission. But even if you look at our code, like we take, like for a company of our size, we contribute so much to open source. Like so much of the code that we build at Artsy, we go the extra mile. Like we take more time an effort to actually take our code and really like wrap it up really nicely and then contribute to the open source community. And we hear people all the time say things like, but like, don't you realize that your competitors can then just like take your open source and use it to accelerate their projects? And actually, that happens. We know it happens. Um, but we just believe in the long-term value of giving and educating and you know, we're confident from a, from a selfish business perspective that that value will come back to us in, in many ways. And I think one of the most obvious of which is that um, we have by far the strongest engineers of any of our competitors because engineers want to work with other great engineers and open source is, a, is an amazing way to, you know, so many startups struggle to find great engineers whereas we feel like we constantly have amazing engineers coming to us through our networks and through open source. So I'd say that's like... Um, another really important part of our culture and our values is we just believe in, in giving and, and, and educating people. I would say in the early days, like, we were kind of constantly running out of money uh, and constantly looking for funding. And there were definitely moments where, you know, I felt like, I think we got to about, at one point we were like seven days away from bankruptcy, and I was like completely out of money personally. Um, no, bank would, no bank would give me a credit. I don't have the like maxing out credit card stories because I, I was never able to get my hands on my credit card. I would have maxed those things out. Um, so, you know, that was very stressful. Like I definitely remember, you know, like just g getting so bad. I, I, it was like hard to move, like hard to like move things forward and you're just so uh, uh, stressed out. Um, so those were kind of like some of the, you know, and just finding the like, drive to like keep moving you know you're kind of like this really sucks but if I don't keep moving forward it's just going to suck even more <laughs> so you know those are those are probably some of the most challenging times just in the early days when just like there's there's no sign that anything's working like you know you don't have traction in terms of revenue you don't have traction in terms of users um, you know you're meeting with galleries in the early days and the galleries are like you know, why should we partner with you? Like, they don't see that they don't believe in like art being online. Like, a lot of investors I met with were just like, "Hey, you know, this is a great idea, but fundamentally, art is never going to be bought and sold online. So your business is just fundamentally fucked." Um, just like hearing a lot of that kind of feedback from both potential customers, you know, users, investors, like, you just get to this point of like, is this thing even going to work? Like, is all the money and energy and time you've spent? actually going to mean anything. So, yeah, those were the toughest moments. But, um, you know, at this point, I think we'd also taken money from, like, friends and family. And, you know, once you take people's money, you don't really have any choice. <laughs> you just have to, like, keep going. Uh, you just can't, like, you just can't give up, you know? This isn't, this isn't like when you're a kid, you can just quit. You can't, like, you can't, like, it's not like band camp. You can't quit. <laughs> so you just, gotta, you just keep going. So... Where will, where will I be and where will Artsy be in five years? Well, um, I think in five years, uh, I mean, in five years, I hopefully, like, way before five years, pretty much anyone, everyone in the world will um, know about Artsy, and my hope is that um, hundreds of millions of people, if not over a billion people, will, be, will, be, will actually be visiting Artsy on, like, a weekly basis. Um, so I think, you know, maybe 1% of those people will actually be buying and selling, but I just want it to be, you know, I just want art to be as popular a part of culture as music or film. 
and I don't see why there why there's any reason it can't be. So in five years, I'm hoping that like at least hundreds of millions of people are visiting Artsy on a on a weekly or at least a monthly basis, just because they've got you know their favorite artists, maybe like really famous global artists, or maybe like their local and their random you know city or their random town or their random village or whatever, you know, or just like whoever the artists in life that that they're most interested in, they've got their favorites. And they're seeing the new art that they're creating. They're they're reading, um, you know, great articles about these artists, or you know, the artist is like taking a picture of like an install shot, and they're just engaging, you know, almost like a social media platform like Facebook or something. Um, and just you know, a lot more people are into art. You know, hopefully, in five years, like ten percent of the entire, like um, at least of the developed world, is like super passionate about art and like reading about it every day. You know, maybe seventy percent like interacts with it casually with friends, goes to shows, and then maybe, you know, maybe 30% will never really care. But, you know, that's kind of like what music and film is like, right? Like 10% of people, it's like their life uh, obsession, and then maybe 70%, it's like something they're interested in. So hopefully we can, you know, whereas like today with art, it's like 1% of people, like, really care. You know, can we get that to like a much higher percentage? Um, and on the business side, um, I just think in five years, like, the market is going to be ten times as big, and I think there's going to be a hundred times as many people buying and selling art, and they're going to be doing it a lot more easily, a lot more efficiently, in a lot more transparent manner. Like a lot, you know, people aren't going to be getting screwed over as often, and as a result, well, many more artists will be creating art, and uh, you know, in a sustainable way, like get, getting paid to do so. Um, many more get, many more people will will get to be artist managers or galleries, um, and that'll that'll just be like a much bigger business. Um, in terms of, you know, I think it'll be a lot, it'll be very similar in many ways, like the film industry or the, the music industry. Um, you know, I, I certainly hope that I'm still CEO in five years, uh, but that's contingent on me um, being the best person for that role and doing a really good job, and uh, if there's someone better, then, uh, then they deserve to be CEO. So uh, you can never take these things uh, for granted. It's, it's not really about me, it's about what's best for Artsy. I think mentors are critical for everyone. For instance, I think like Ed Shao just tell you know just very efficiently is telling me at class, hey, I think you actually have what it takes. Like, you know, that was like a one second thing he said, but that was really important. <laughs> so that was really valuable. Um, uh, uh, Joe Kennedy, who was Princeton uh, eighty nine, I believe, also um, computer science and electrical engineering. He's the C or he was the CEO of Pandora at the time. He actually came and gave the um, the keynote speech for the Princeton Entrepreneurship Conference. And after the conference, I just kind of like ran up to him. It was like the worst time because everyone's trying to talk to him. And I remember just like kind of jumping into the fray and being like, hey, Joe, I'm about to graduate. Also computer science engineering, starting Pandora for art. <laughs> like really, like I'm about to go. I was just like, what is the most like sound bite? You know, like I am like the younger version of you. Like um, will you help me when I go out to California? And he was like, this is my email address, shoot me an email. He just said it, and then, you know, like, disappeared among the frenzy of people, like, trying to talk to him. Um, and I was like, well, at least I went for it, you know, whatever. Shot off an email to that email address, you know, didn't think too much about it. And he responded. And he, <laughs> and then he actually met up with me. He, he invited me to Pandora's offices in California, like, gave me a tour of the office, like, showed me the music genomers. With, like, now Artsy has its own, like, genome team that we can show to people, and, like, they have that too. It was, like, real. Um, I would say the music genomers um, are very different from the art genomers. It tends to be, like, I remember the music genomers were just, like, these, these big dudes with, like, massive beards and, like, large headphones. And I would say uh, that's not... It's not typical of, of an art genomer. Uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, and he took me out to lunch, and, you know, he just started advising me and, and, like, giving me a lot of helpful hints, like, you know, things from, like, high-level company stuff all the way to um, here's actually how to think about the algorithms. I mean, here's how, to, here's how to make it a scalable way of, like, computing similarity and making recommendations. So a lot of just very practical stuff. So I'd say he was a huge, uh, he was a huge help as well. For a Princeton undergraduate with entrepreneurial ambitions. Okay, first and foremost, it's a really great time in life to take on risk and to put yourself in situations of discomfort but maximal learning. And in many ways, going to Princeton is, you know, it's very stressful, it's very intense, but you're going to learn a lot. And you want to keep on riding that wave of, like, being a little bit, feeling over your head, feeling intimidated, feeling uncomfortable, but learning a lot. 
Um, so that's like one general theme of whatever you choose to do with your life post Princeton. Um, second thing, the biggest mistake I see even very smart people make is they do they underestimate the importance of people. And what I mean by that is there's this great quote, I think like Drew Houston talked about it in his keynote or his uh, uh, class day speech at MIT, which was, um, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Um, that's obviously a simplification, but you know the general idea is like the people you spend time with, you know maybe you're learning from them or being inspired by them directly, but there's also just something to like this sort of like process of like osmosis. Like there's just something where like you're, it's almost like bacteria like exchanging DNA, you know, in the early days of evolution. Um, you want to really surround yourself with amazing people, people who are both inspiring people who, who, who do great things, but also people who care about having a positive impact, like people who care about helping others and making the world a better place, because that, that will also rub off on you. And you can have one and not the other, right? You can have like really awesome people who are kind of like, like mean. <laughs> you can have like really awesome, happy people who like never do anything. You know, you really want to find people who are both. And then you want to surround yourself with them. And the most obvious way to do that is the people you work with. Um, and that's really important. Like, more than anything else in life, I would actually optimize, especially right out of college, to work with people who are amazing. But by the way, it's not just your, your professional life, right? That's like who you choose to have as your roommates. I see people just like go into roommate situations without really thinking through who they're going to be living with. And then, you know, 30% of their time and energy gets caught up in this like weird negative, you know, mess at home. Same as the people you have relationships with. It's like, choose those people really, really carefully because they are going to be the people that are going to be constantly transferring energy to you and either in an inspiring, positive way or perhaps in a like, you know, everything sucks, like, you know, there's no point way. Like, which way do you want people kind of constantly, you know, what do you want your true north to be? So professional life, personal life, romantic life, like, you know, your roommates, it, it all adds up. It's all important. So that's the, and I see really smart people underestimate that and make that mistake all the time. Don't, don't make that mistake. Um, the other thing I would say is whatever you're doing, especially early on, I would maximize growth opportunity tremendously. If you read Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In, she talks about like the, the, the career advice she always gives to people is to optimize for growth. And I think particularly situations where there's opportunities for compounding growth. Like when we were evolving as animals on the plains, we never had to deal with like, you know, predators who could like run after us at like an exponentially increasing speed like that'd be the scariest thing ever like we never had to deal with that like our brains are just not like we never had to evolve to deal with like exponential like compounding forces and so it's something that we tend to underestimate that's why a lot of people go bankrupt is they just don't or a lot of people like default on loans is they you know compounding interest it always seems like so small but it adds up in t over time in really powerful ways um, the positive side of this is that if you join a company that has a compounding growth effect, so like joining Facebook in the early days, <laughs> joining Artsy Now, I'm just going to put that plug in, but like, you know, joining a company like Artsy Now has that compounding growth, and what that means is that if you take someone who joins a company that's awesome and doing really well today, and you take another person, like very similar background, but it's joining a company that's like doing pretty well today, but you're starting to see, you know, it's not as big, it's not as exciting yet, but you're starting to see that compounding growth curve. It's like, you know, like, like imagine when, when Sheryl Sandberg was thinking about joining Google, she had all these other way more exciting opportunities at like bigger companies that paid better, like had larger teams to manage. Or same thing when she was looking at Facebook. There's so many like cool tech companies that were offering to make her the CEO. But she chose to be the COO of a company that had that really exciting growth curve, that compounding growth rate. Like those that like decision, you know, ten years later, um, you know, like you can just have like completely different like outcomes. It can be like a complete life changer. So I think that's the most important thing. It's just, you know, just essentially I'm repackaging the same advice you'd get from from Shale Sandberg's book, Lean In, just like optimize for for growth. So just to summarize, get out of your comfort zone, take risks, think really hard about the people that you'll be working with professionally, but just throughout your entire life. Um, and then optimize for that compounding growth. I'm Carter Cleveland, and I'm a Princeton entrepreneur.